begin today with a story about uh, when I was an undergraduate and we were working uh, at USC and we started this thing that we like to call the Rock Propulsion Lab, which was a motley group of undergraduate students. Uh, there were 10 of us to begin with. This is us with our first rocket after an intense two-week building session and not many nights of sleep in those two weeks. <laughs> um, the, the rocket lab was really inspirational to a lot of us. It, it provided an outlet that was unique among university groups in that we got to actually build things and fly them and enjoy kind of the practical aspects of engineering. This was our very first rocket that we built. We've flown it successfully three times, actually, and gotten it back, all three, which is unique for university rocket teams, by the way. They tend to not work the first time. But uh, what's also unique about Rocket Lab is that by my senior year, the group had grown to about 40 students. There's not 40 in this picture, but there were 40. These were the only ones who cared enough to come to the group picture <laughs> at the end of the year. So Rocket Lab was, was very interesting because it, it shows that there is some draw to, to science and engineering in, I think, pretty much every student who comes to university. What is it about rockets that pulls you in enough that it makes you want to forgo everything and, and do this uh, as your one social obligation? The lab is actually still going strong, even though I've, I've left uh, USC and uh, the original founders have left USC. Three years later, uh, this is their group picture they just took a few months ago with their rocket traveler they're going to try and launch to space uh, next month. Wow. So, Rocket Lab is a great example of, of kind of the interesting part of rocketry. I mean, for some reason, people decided not to go to fraternities, decided not to go to sororities, decided not to do their homework in some cases, and instead got together and flew these rockets that go supersonic speeds, that go into the stratosphere, that are really quite spectacular. And uh, the Board of Trustees really liked this because it brings in more students and actually grew the Astronautical Engineering Department from, uh, from a very seven students in the beginning to uh, over 50 today. And uh, the lab is still going strong. And uh, the real question that bugs me still is why? Why are rockets so interesting? Um, it's kind of a human interest question. And I don't have my PhD yet, so I figure we should ask a real PhD. Um, this is Dr. Franklin Cosden uh, roasting a weenie over a hot rocket motor test stand after a firing. Uh, Frank got his PhD from MIT in 68. He got his master's degree from Princeton in 62, despite his clothing choices. And the way that he put it to me uh, in one conversation was, I like working on rockets because when they work, they're cool, and when they don't, they're really cool. <laughs> and I think it's this cool, really cool dichotomy that really dragged me through the hobby and kind of got me interested in it. When I was seven years old, it was the first time I got into rockets. Well, seven-ish, according to my biography. <laughs> this is a picture of me in sixth grade with my science project. Uh, rocket that I flew. And I had done planes, I had done cars, I had done uh, trains, but nothing really drew me in. Like when we went to that science camp and we set up our first Estes rocket on the launch pad and flew it. That was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. I knew right then that, that was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And uh, luckily my parents supported me in this endeavor because in California everything is very dry and you have to drive like three hours to get to the desert to fly your rockets. And uh, so my parents were willing to put up with that, get up early hours on the weekends and, and take me out and encourage my development in the hobby. And uh, even though I didn't hit my growth spurt, the rockets kept getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> until eventually I decided, you know, maybe I actually do want to do this uh, in real life when I grow up. And uh, that leads us right back to USC, where I chose to go and uh, study astronautical engineering and try and become a real rocket scientist. So we were somewhere in about here. And this is the end of senior year at USC. Uh, that's me on the end right there, along with our uh, lab friends and everyone who put this rocket together. And it was about this time that everyone was trying to decide where they wanted to go, what they wanted to do with their lives. It was the end of the bachelor's degree, uh, the end of four years of hard study, and in our case, uh, hard work building rockets. A lot of people went to a company called SpaceX in California, where they're uh, building the next generation of launch vehicles to power Americans into space. A couple people went to Raytheon to work on missiles. One person went to Virgin Galactic to work on taking tourists up. And a couple people went to Blue Origin, which is a company owned by Jeff Bezos from Amazon.com. And uh, so I was sitting there with all these really, really smart people who were going off into the world to do very, very important things. And I said to myself, well, what should I do? How can I contribute to the future of aerospace and the future of humanity, really? Because aerospace is the way that we're going to save our planet one day when an asteroid comes to us. And uh, so I could look at, I looked at all these companies and I interned at SpaceX for a while and said, okay, I could get used to this, but I took the coward route out and applied to grad school instead. And uh, I ended up going to Purdue for my master's degree, kind of on a whim, at the recommendation of one of my professors. He said, you should go to Purdue. You'll have a good time there. So I said, sure, why not? And uh, I'm a native Californian, but I packed up all my stuff in Los Angeles and drove out to the cornfields of West Lafayette, Indiana, which is pretty much halfway between Chicago and Indianapolis, so in the middle of nothing. And uh, it's a great place to fly and test rockets. 
This is the lab complex that I work at today. It's called the Maurice J. Zucro Laboratories, named for uh, the first PhD student that Purdue graduated, named Maurice Zucro, uh, in the 30s. Uh, Dr. Zucro set up the lab originally at the airport next to the campus. Uh, all was going really fine until he blew the roof off the building. I said, why don't you go out there into that open field where there's, uh, there's nothing to hit that's of value, except for the corn and, and I guess the graduate students, but they don't really count. And uh, so this is a facility that we set up. Um, it's one of the most capable university facilities in the world. Uh, we have several test cells that can fire up to, in this case down here, 10,000 pounds of thrust. So it's designed for full-scale testing uh, on a university scale. And we can do things like hypersonics research. We have an air system that can supply 2,200 PSI, uh, pounds per square inch of air pressure, for very, very long-run uh, hypersonic testing as well. So it's a great place to be because not only do we have these excellent facilities, but we're also surrounded by this community of engineers who are really, really into rockets and rocket propulsion specifically. There's about 70 students that work out at the Zucro Labs complex. It's 60 acres, so it's more than one student per acre, which is, I guess, high concentration from the Midwest, or so they say. So um, I guess let's bring it back and talk a little bit about the research that's happening right now at Zucro, or at least some, that some of my friends are doing. Uh, this is uh, Steve Shark over here. His last name is Shark. His first name is Steve. His mom's name is Patty. Uh, we had t-shirts made for our volleyball team. And uh, Steve is working on this uh, molecule called aluminum hydride, or allane. Allane was discovered by the Russians in the 60s and uh, has shown lots of potential for performance for uh, rocket propellants. The thing about rocket propellants is the lighter the molecules that are in the propellant, the better performance the propellant gets you. So traditional rocket propellants like aluminum are pretty heavy, but when you add all these hydrogens to it, all the little white dots on the uh, pinks here, that gets you a lot more performance. The problem with allane is that it's also what we call pyrophoric, which means that when it touches air, when it touches oxygen, it immediately combusts into flame, which is kind of a problem if you want to store your rocket for a while. <laughs> so what Shark is working on doing is taking this allane and encapsulating it in some very special plastic that he has, so that when he sprays the oxidizer over it to make the rocket turn on, it ignites immediately. When he takes the oxidizer away, it stops. He's managed to do that. Shark is almost done with his PhD, so I'm very, very jealous of him. <laughs> um, my friend Cattell, David Cattell, we share a first name, so we go by last names at the lab, uh, is working on uh, this propellant called Alice. And for those of you who are very, very fast, you can realize that Alice is a uh, combination of aluminum and ice. The aluminum water reaction has been known since the 50s to produce lots of hydrogen. Remember, that's our friend in propulsion, hydrogen. But uh, the issue is that it was always too slow. But with the advent of nanotechnology in the past 10 years, the addition of nanoscale aluminum to this aluminum ice reaction made it happen fast enough for use in rocket propulsion. Rockets are really challenging devices because they're very, very energy dense. You have to pack a lot of energy into a very tight space and then release it all in the same direction at one time. If you release it in all directions, it's a bomb. That's not good. <laughs> So the addition of nano-sized aluminum increased the reaction rate to where we could actually do a lot of research with this aluminum ice repellent and get it to work fairly well, at least for water. I and mean, for actual practical purposes, we're not so sure yet. Um, this is one of my favorite slides in here. My friend Trevor is working on uh, a system to diagnose exactly how rocket propellant burns. We've known since the 60s how to make rocket propellant, and it's kind of like a cake recipe. You have this one ingredient that you mix with a gooey ingredient, you stir them together, you cook it for a while, and then unlike a cake, you intentionally burn it at the end. And uh, when you actually burn it, it's this mixture of salt within this gooey binder. The problem is that the salt is very, very fine in size. Oh, no, the video showed up there. That's awkward. The salt is very, very fine in size. So we have no idea what's going to be happening as the stuff is burning. And the other problem is that the salt is about 20 microns. And so the flame that come off of it is less than 10 microns in size. It's less than the width of a human hair. And the flames are gone and faster than the blink of an eye. And we never had really any idea of what this flame structure looked like until Trevor figured out a way to use a laser pulse fast enough to look exactly at what's happening. And uh, I would show you, but the slide is blank, so that's kind of awkward, so we'll move right along. Uh, and every now and then, um, as is the case in my research, you get lucky enough that you get to play with some brand new molecule that's out there. Uh, propulsion is very unique because there's a very, very small set of ingredients that you can work with. Some of them burn really well, but they burn way too fast. Others of them don't burn fast enough, and they don't, you can't use them for propellants at all. So when you get a new molecule to play with that might be a good propellant, you go for it completely, as much as you possibly can. This is the molecule that I'm working with. Uh, it was first synthesized in 2008 by Los Alamos National Labs. You might know them because they made the atomic bomb, if you've heard of that. And uh, this molecule is very, very nice because it's lots of oxygens, so that's very, very helpful for, uh, for making the propellant burn. Uh, and we're using this as potentially uh, several applications across guns, rockets, hypersonic vehicles, all sorts of brand new things that are out there. So what kind of ties all these research objects together and uh, what is it that, that really makes us 
kind of want to do aerospace research in the first place. I mean, yeah, there's the cool part, but anybody who's been through a PhD knows that when you're actually in the process of doing your research, you get up close to the face of what's brand new, the, the edge of the adjacent possible. And you get really depressed because you're just like, oh man, this is all there is, and you keep trying experiments and they keep failing, and you try and you fail. So it takes a lot of gumption to get through it. And uh, so there's got to be other reasons besides this whiz-bang wow factor that we talked about earlier. And I think one of the big reasons is that aerospace is a large contributor to, uh, to the economy. Aerospace contributes 2.3% of the GDP in the US. Uh, this was 2009 data. Uh, ahead of automobiles, in fact, but just behind information technology. And uh, the other nice thing about aerospace is that this 2.3% contribution is very, very high technology. Uh, NASA, for instance, uh, knows this, and they put out a magazine called Spinoffs for all the technology developments that NASA creates in-house that can then be used elsewhere, like Tang and Velcro and uh, astronaut ice cream, even though I think that's disgusting. And the nice thing about aerospace is that it's high enough technology that it's also a good motivator. Um, as everyone's favorite astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson says, that aerospace and NASA are a flywheel of innovation because they influence not only the direct spin-offs that we talked about, but they actually influence the entire culture itself. And that's really, really important because I can't count the number of people that I've heard said that the space race inspired them to go into careers in science and technology. Whether it's aerospace or not, they were inspired to create brand new things, tangible objects, because of what we were doing in space. It's a very, very inspirational topic. So with all this you know, excitement and everything, there's a lot of technological challenge involved too, but we actually have a problem in aerospace today. And uh, to illustrate that, I'd like to take this example here. This is the launch of an Atlas V carrying a payload called Curiosity. It went to Mars. I don't know if you guys heard about that, but uh, <laughs> there's this robot, robot rocket-powered sky crane, right, that, that lowered a Hummer onto the surface of another planet. So that's kind of cool. Curiosity launched on top of this Atlas V rocket, which is obviously version 5 in a long line of Atlas launch vehicles. This is the very, one of the very first Atlases that launched from Cape Kennedy back in 1963. And uh, this illustrates the problem in aerospace right now, especially in aerospace propulsion. The top stage of this Atlas V over here is powered by an engine called RL-10 that was developed by Pratt & Whitney in the 50s. The top stage of this rocket right here is also powered by an RL-10. RL-10 is a great hydrogen engine. It's hydrogen and oxygen is what it burns. And remember, hydrogen is our friend. Hydrogen is very, very light. It burns very well. So you can't do any better than that. And so we've kind of run into this wall, this chemical wall of performance that we can't surpass right now in aerospace. And as a result, not very many engine systems are being funded and put into the field these days. Uh, the mean age of an engineer in the aerospace field right now is 45 years old. And as a result of that, most of those people, actually I think like some like 97% of those people, have not worked on an engine that's in the field today. We're all relying on 50s technology because it works really well. We're in these chemical boundaries of, of what's possible. So as a result of that, not many of them feel very challenged. And actually, 45% of engineers in the field of aerospace propulsion plan to leave within the next five years, which is a pretty depressing statistic for up-and-comers like myself and Shark and Cattell and Trevor and all those people at our lab that I showed you. Because we want to be challenged. We want to contribute to society somehow using the stuff that we love so much, that we're so passionate about. That's not just cool. That's way cool. So what are we supposed to do about this? We know that people are into the aerospace industry because of the technical challenge because of the high impact that it has, and because of the visceral interest that we talked about before. So what can we do to keep ourselves challenged, to keep our interest going through this entire process? I mean, yes, there's research right now going on in high-pressure hydrocarbon engines for boost uh, that are going to perform as well as hydrogen engines, but have a lot uh, denser systems, which is very useful for uh, first-stage engines. There's a lot of research right now in hypersonic propulsion, dealing with air, bringing in the air to uh, increase the performance of your rocket without increasing its size but of course that only works in air. But I think the most important thing that our generation is working on right now is uh, cheap commercial access to space. Because all this time we've been chasing performance, we've been chasing you know, efficiency in rockets, we've been chasing how can we put up the most payload for the least dollar. But right now, the only thing that's left for us to do is to work on that, that cost uh, amount. And uh, if you look at where all these people from USC ended up, you know, SpaceX, Virgin, Blue, these are all companies that are working to lower the cost of space access with a common goal in mind. They're full of bright young engineers, like all these people from USC, who are there right now working to lower the cost of space access so that one day all of us can get together and get into a Dragon capsule and fly to Mars. Because right now, you know, we're all stuck here on Earth, and there is no purer joy than to leave the bonds of Earth and dance across the sky upon laughter-silvered wings, as the poem goes. And so I think that within the next 20, 30 years, within my lifetime certainly, we're going to get together and be able to leave this planet 
and everyone will be able to get closer to rockets and experience the pure visceral joy that they encapsulate. Thank you very much.